Hi, everyone. Welcome back. In this mini lecture, we're going to continue our discussion of electrons in a periodic potential. Now, we spent some time talking about Bloch's theorem and the implications of this for electronic wave functions and energy levels. Um, we decided that, in general, we should expect um, something like band structure to emerge, where one has discrete energy bands that are periodic in the reciprocal lattice K, um, and they're indexed by band index N. Um, now, even though we've been studying free electrons for the most part uh, during the previous uh, lectures in this class, now we're going to start talking about uh, the details of how electrons interact with the periodic lattice of the ions. Uh, so again, we've been thinking about uh, the general form of block wave functions so far. These are the wave functions that electrons must have in a periodic potential. We've sort of illustrated what, what block wave functions do and what they look like using free electrons. Now we're going to explicitly calculate what happens when we allow non-zero coupling to the lattice. So let's start by remembering the form of the block wave functions, or one form. So if I suppress the band index n, we can write the wave function psi with quantum number k as the sum over all reciprocal lattice vectors big K, C of little k minus big K times e to the i little k minus big K dot r. Okay. Um, remember, we saw that we could write the wave function like this uh, when we proved Bloch's theorem by expanding the Schrodinger equation and the wave functions uh, as a Fourier series in plane waves. So this wave function uh, is a solution to the Schrodinger equation, which can be written in the following way. So again, in the last few mini lectures, we discussed this form of the Schrodinger equation. It's simply a restatement of the conventional Schrodinger equation. Uh, we've been able to simplify it somewhat because we can expand the wave function in plane waves and also the lattice in, uh, in plane waves. So this sum is over all reciprocal lattice vectors, uh, big K prime. Um, And remember also that for fixed little k, there are infinitely many solutions uh, to this uh, uh, equation, uh, which correspond to all uh, possible values of k in the first go one zone. Okay, so today we're going to take steps toward solving this equation uh, when the u's here are non-zero, when there's a non-zero coupling to the lattice. So we're going, to note, we're going to denote the unperturbed energies in the following way. We're going to use E0 to indicate an unperturbed energy. So E0 corresponding to wave vector Q is h bar squared Q squared over 2m. So with this notation, the Schrodinger equation becomes E0 of little k minus big K minus the eigenvalue E times C little k minus big K plus the sum on k prime U of big K minus k prime C of little k minus k prime. This must equal zero. So we're going to talk about two cases. The first is where um, we, have, we don't have any degeneracies in the, the energy spectrum. Uh, so we'll, we'll find out what happens to the energy uh, at wave vector, at a particular wave vector when there are no other energies uh, nearby. 
Um, in the next mini lecture, we'll talk about the case where the unperturbed energies are degenerate. Uh, we'll find that this is the more interesting case of the two. Uh, this is the case where band gaps can arise, uh, though the non-degenerate case is somewhat simpler to think about and it illustrates our basic uh, strategy. So let's do that first. So let's talk about the non-degenerate case first. So in particular, that means that E0 of little k minus some reciprocal lattice vector big K1 minus E0 of little k minus another reciprocal lattice vector big K is much, much larger than U, where big K is not equal to K1. So, um, here we're imagining in the Schrodinger equation that we've fixed uh, the big K that appears to be K1. So in a sense, we're asking about what happens to a particular uh, energy level indexed by little k and big K1. Um, we're saying with this equation that the unperturbed energy is not near any other energies, E0 of little k minus big K. And by not near, we mean the difference in energy is much, much larger than U, where U is the typical magnitude of one of these Fourier coefficients uh, of, of the potential. All right, so let's set big K is equal to K1. Then the Schrodinger equation gives E minus E0, little k minus big K1 times C of little k minus big K1 is equal to the sum on K U of big K minus K1, C of little k minus K1. So we dropped uh, the prime indexed. We dropped the prime on the index for the sum on the on the right hand side. Um, so again, we've fixed big K to be K1, and we're also imagining that little k is fixed. The thing that we want to find in the Schrodinger equation is this actual energy uh, E. Um, we'd like to find what is this, what is the, the perturbed energy at wave vector little k minus K1. Um, of course, it depends on the unperturbed energy as well as uh, the parameters of the potential, and in fact, all of these coefficients C. Okay, so we'll have to make some approximations to make headway. Um, you'll, you'll see how this plays out in the next few uh, slides here. We're going to do perturbation theory, uh, which is perhaps something that uh, uh, something that you've been expecting. So we're going to expect that the coupling to the potential is uh, rather smaller than the, the energies themselves. All right, so to make our lives easier, let's set u of zero equals zero. This just means that the mean value of the potential is zero. If you like, the zeroth Fourier component is just the mean value of the potential uh, by adding an offset, which won't change the physics of the problem, uh, we can make the mean value of the potential equal to zero, thus the zeroth Fourier component should be equal to zero. Uh, what this allows us to say uh, is that only terms with big K not equal to K1 will contribute in this sum over here. Um, and because they are multiplied by uh, the, because uh, they're multiplied by these, these coefficients here, uh, we expect them to be small because they're zero in, uh, in, in the unperturbed case, uh, right? The energy is identically equal uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the unperturbed value uh, in, in the unperturbed case. And if we allow the, the perturbation to occur, uh, we expect to mix in uh, small numbers of coefficients uh, with, wave, with, with uh, wave vector little k minus reciprocal lattice vectors other than k1. So again, in the unperturbed case, only c of little k minus k, uh, k, k1 is, is, 
is, is non-zero. And in fact, I see that I've made a mistake here. Um, so hopefully this makes more sense to you. So this, the sum on the right-hand side is a sum of um, Fourier, coefficients of Fourier coefficients of the potentials times the wave function coefficients. Uh, and the wave function coefficients are C of little k minus big K, where big K um, goes over all of the reciprocal lattice vectors. Now, again, in the unperturbed case, it's only C of little k minus k1 that's non-zero. Um, that corresponds to a free electron wave function, this particular wave vector. When we allow, allow weak coupling to the potential, we'll expect that others of these coefficients, for example, C of little k minus k2 or C of little k minus k3, where these are also reciprocal lattice vectors, will be non-zero, but they should still be small, again, because uh, this is weak coupling to a potential. So, but these terms will be small. Good. Uh, what we need to do then, uh, in order to find the actual perturbed energy, is to find out exactly what happens to these coefficients, c of little k minus big K, uh, in the presence of this perturbation. So let's rearrange uh, now the Schrodinger equation. Um, let's rearrange this equation here. Um, I'm going to drop the index 1 here because I'm going to understand it, that it applies to all of the coefficients. So I can write C of little k minus big K is equal to the sum on k prime U of k prime minus k, C of little k minus k prime divided by E minus E zero, little k minus big K. Again, this is just a restatement of the Schrodinger equation. Here I've removed the index one on, on big K because I'm imagining that this applies to, to, all, uh, to all reciprocal lattice vectors big K. Let me break this into two parts here, the sum into two parts. So here's U of K one minus K. C of k minus k1 over e minus e0 little k minus um, big k plus all the rest. Good. Um, we've separated out uh, the k minus k1 term over here because this is the term uh, we expect to be the largest. Again, here's this coefficient c of little k minus k1. This is the thing we expect to be the largest. We expect all of these other things uh, to be small. So uh, let's say then that an arbitrary coefficient c of little k minus big k is equal to u k1 minus k, c of little k minus k1 over e minus e0 of little k minus k, plus terms of order u squared. Uh, they should be at least of order u squared because we'll expect that the coefficient c of little k minus big k, or big k not equal to k1, uh, should be at least of, of order u. So the product then of that coefficient times the Fourier component of the potential should be at least of order u squared. So this is now uh, uh, a, an expression for the perturbed wave function coefficients uh, in terms of the one we expect to be largest. And uh, this is correct now to order u. Uh, and so in fact, we can imagine that this term here uh, is the unperturbed coefficient. So let's plug this expression for the coefficients here into the Schrodinger equation. So now again, we're fixing K1. We're talking about a particular wave vector. Let me restate the Schrodinger equation, the version of the Schrodinger equation that we're working with.
okay? So again, I dropped the prime on this index k here. Um, because we assume that u of zero is equal to zero, uh, there is no term here where big K is equal to, to K1. Thus, we can write this now using the expression we derived above as the sum on K, U of K minus K1. Now I'm gonna write down this expression for the C's. So this is U of U of K1 minus K, E minus E0 of little k minus big K times C of little k minus K1. Uh, now, because our expression for the coefficients is correct to order U squared, uh, the additional terms will be of order U cubed. Okay, so what you can see now looking at this equation is that the perturbed energies, here's the difference between the perturbed and the unperturbed energies, differ uh, from the, the, the unperturbed energies by terms of order u squared. Okay, so So in general, we expect uh, a small correction uh, in this case, and that's really the message of this discussion of the case of non-degenerate perturbation theory. The correction to the energies in the presence of a weak coupling to a potential uh, without a degeneracy in this unperturbed spectrum is small. It's of second order in the potential. Okay, um, so if, if we realize that the correction is of order u squared, um, we can replace uh, the perturbed energy by the unperturbed energy in the energy denominator that we just wrote down. Um, in this case, you can see if we cancel the coefficients from both sides, we cancel the C's from both sides. Our expression for the perturbed energy becomes the following. So here's the replacement we made in the energy denominator here. Uh, we replaced uh, uh, we replaced the, the unperturbed, or rather replaced the perturbed energy by, by the unperturbed energy. Uh, this still yields something that is uh, correct to of order u squared here, okay? So again, the message here is that the energy shift in the presence of weak coupling to potential is of order u squared for non-degenerate levels. Uh, it is rather small as one might expect. Uh, and so not much happens in this case. So this is different now in the case of uh, a degeneracy in the unperturbed spectrum, and that's what we'll look at next time. This is exactly the case where one can have uh, an energy gap that arises.